What's the difference between a systematic review and a meta-analysis? Stick around and find out today on this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up everybody, my name is Dr. Jay Phoenix Singh and I want to warmly welcome you to this episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to advance your career in academia. Before we get started, you know I appreciate the love, so please take a moment to like this video, share it with your friends, with your colleagues, with your students, and be sure to comment below. We always love to hear from you, especially if you have recommendations for future episodes. You can also follow us on these social media accounts. So you've decided to get into the field of reviewing. Now, this is an incredibly important area when it comes to scientific research because eventually in any field you have so many primary studies that they literally almost can be perceived as individual trees. But you can spend so much time looking at these trees that you literally forget to see the forest itself. It's so important to be able to zoom out and see that 10,000 foot view every now and again. And that's what the field of reviewing does. Now, there's three main kinds of reviews. We have narrative reviews, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And my goal today is to be able to distinguish them for you. Uh, narrative reviews first. The thing about a narrative review is that basically you can use it as a soapbox to be able to say whatever you want. For example, some people are very anti-vaccination, for example. Regardless of the tremendous amount of peer-reviewed research literature suggesting that there is no harm that comes from vaccination, uh, you still have some research, very few pieces, but a few pieces that suggest that there could be some issues there. If you want to do a narrative review, you could just disregard the preponderance of scientific research and write an entire piece talking about, you know, the, the potential harms of vaccination. You could put that in there, right? And if you wanted to, you can make the whole article on that without even mentioning everything else. Uh, so it can serve as almost a political soapbox. And of course, you could also do it the other way. You could basically get on the soapbox and talk about everybody needs to be vaccinated and never mention there that there is any kind of counter arguments that people talk about in the field as well. You can do either. We see this all the time with stuff like climate change and a variety of other kind of politically contentious issues where the research literature is relatively clear. So. Uh, that is a narrative review. At the end of the day, we're not specifically going through the literature uh, to be able to kind of have a systematic review of anything. We're just doing it to be able to give you a general sense of me, the author, or the authorship team's opinion, essentially, uh, on a given area. Second, we've got a systematic review. Now, a systematic review is really where we start to inject really just the concept of science into the reviewing process. And really, it's going to take a few key steps to get a systematic review done. The first step is conducting what's called a systematic search. The idea here is that you're going to go onto a database, a search database, like a Google Scholar, an ERIC, a CINAHL, an Embase, a PubMed, right? Um, there are so many of these things, and depending on the field that you're in, you're going to be able to find ones that uh, really have or focus on your field's literature, because there's so many tens of thousands of journals out there. No single search engine can really do a great job at really drilling down for uh, for every single field together, right? So find the one that really has the bet that is going to be the best bet for you. Once you've got it. Come up with a list of search terms. These are going to be terms that you can either use one by one or you can combine them using what are called Boolean operators. If you don't know how to spell Boolean, it's B-O-O-L-E-A-N. And what you're going to do is essentially use these operators, words like or, and, the use of parentheses, the use of quotes. Uh, there, there's so many ways to be able to do this, to systematically search the entire literature uh, for articles that meet your pre-specified inclusion criteria. Now, you gotta come up with inclusion criteria, and these could be things like publication status. Maybe you wanna include everything, maybe you wanna say no conference presentations, no government white papers, uh, I only want things that have been published in peer-reviewed journals already, and within a certain date range, maybe only between 2000 until the present year. Maybe it could be something where you only want studies published in Europe, Maybe you only want studies uh, uh, where the sample is comprised 100% of women. 
Whatever it is, you get to pick, but make sure that in your methods section when you're writing it up, you're really clear about the terms that you searched, the uh, limits that you set, uh, ev all this kind of stuff, right? What search databases did you search? You gotta be really transparent such that somebody else could come, use the identical methodology and get the exact same findings. This is science, right? It's gotta be reproducible, it's critical. So that is the systematic search. Now when you're done, you gotta get your hands on these articles, and this could take a long time, but once you've got the different pieces, you gotta read everything. Usually you're gonna come up with a coding sheet in terms of information you want to extract. Maybe you want to extract things like, uh, let's say that you're taking a look at the efficacy of a drug. Let's say you're in Big Pharma, right? And you're doing a review on, let's say, the efficacy of Zoloft, right? Uh, and the, uh, the effect size that you're going to take out of every single study is something called Cohen's D, right? which is a measure of, uh, of efficacy, right, of uh, intervention. So, okay, so out of everything, I can extract Cohen's D's to the extent possible, right? Uh, as well as just demographic information. What percentage of the, the, uh, uh, of the sample is male? Uh, what is the average age? Uh, what is the diagnostic breakdown of people in the sample? Uh, were they in the community or in an institution? Whatever, there's so many things you could pick apart and usually you do that with uh, some sort of a coding sheet and then after you actually have done that coding, you should have a secondary person come in and code, like recode a random sample of what you've coded and then take a look at the inter-rater reliability of the codings using something like a Cohen's Kappa, an intraclass correlation coefficient, also known as an ICC. Something like that to be able to, again, scientifically prove that you've extracted the data correctly. Now, when that's done though, you're basically done. And what I mean by that is that then you can do thematic analyses, you can read the papers, look for patterns in the data, but you are not quantitatively synthesizing. You're not taking those individual Cohen's Ds that you've collected and wrapping them together to be able to get kind of one summary Cohen's D. You're not doing that, okay? This is the end of the systematic review. And systematic reviews are great to be able to come up with uh, with both suggestions for future research, but also to be able to recap what's already been done in a field, right? So it's more hypothesis generating than it is hypothesis testing, as it were. Now in terms of hypothesis testing, you'd wanna go on to the third approach. And the third approach is a meta-analysis. Now, think about it like this. Every meta-analysis is a systematic review, but not every systematic review is a meta-analysis, okay? Now what does that mean? Well, to do a meta-analysis, you gotta do everything that I just said for a systematic review. The only difference is that we're going to use very advanced statistical techniques, and there's so many kinds of meta-analysis. Tabular meta-analyses, individual data analysis, network meta-analysis, there's so many of these things. But we're going to use it to be able to combine quantitatively the findings of each of those individual studies. And that's going to produce for us what's called a summary effect estimate. Instead of just Cohen's D from each study, we're gonna get a pooled Cohen's D, right? And in addition to that, for some effect estimates, like let's say odds ratios where you'll have a standard error, you wouldn't just have a pooled odds ratio when you put them together, you're also gonna have a pooled standard error. So you're also going to have not only a central of uh, a measure of central tendency, but also a dispersion parameter, okay? It's like a mean and a standard deviation, or a beta and a standard error, or whatever it is, okay? Uh, and you're going to get all of that. And then you're going to be able to statistically take a look where, you know, for the systematic review, we said, well, you know, if we do a thematic analysis, we found that, uh, you know, studies where there was a lower mean age, there appeared to be uh, higher Cohen's Ds. Okay, great, but we can't statistically test that. For a meta-analysis, we can, though. For a meta-analysis, we can take a look at what are referred to as sources of heterogeneity, meaning if there are differences in between uh, different studies and their effect sizes, like odds ratios or Cohen's D, maybe they're systematic in nature. There's something that is resulting in that, and you can explore what those are through exploring sources of heterogeneity. 
And you do this either using subgroup analysis, which is kind of dichotomous in nature. You would say, okay, here's all the samples with an average age under 25 and then of 25 and over. And you just kind of take a look at them overall, compare their confidence intervals, and there you go. That's it, right? But there's no like p-value, right? It's not a null hypothesis statistical testing situation. If you want that, you go to what's called meta-regression, where just like with regular regression, you would have independent variables, which in this case would be the mean age of every sample, and then the outcome variable, which would be either Cohen's D or the odds ratio of every single sample. And then you would run regression, except modified because it's meta-regression, right? As opposed to, uh, to just regular, you know, linear logistic regression. And there you go. You'd be able to really make Make some more definitive conclusions about the reason why there's fluctuation between studies if you do find that there are fluctuations that there are between study uh, sources of heterogeneity so that is a meta-analysis all right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that brief rundown. There's so much more to be said about systematic reviewing and meta-analysis. If you have any questions, please do comment below. Don't forget before I leave you to like this video, share it with your friends, colleagues, and students, follow us on social media, and if you want one-on-one -on -one career mentoring or counseling, including to be able to talk more about the subject of meta-analysis and systematic reviewing, and how you can best use one of these types of methodologies to be able to uh, really master uh, a field that you're working in right now, or maybe there's not many of these reviews, but you really want to give it a try, please do get in touch with me via the website below, and let's chat about it. Signing off, everyone. Thank you so much for watching, and don't forget to get out there, take chances, and be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.